And I thought maybe you could speak a little bit about your background, because you didn't actually start photography, that wasn't your first career in a way. You were an anaesthetist beforehand, <coughs> and growing up in China to two parents who are doctors, and I think you shared with us last night that until you really came to photography, you'd only ever known doctors in that's your right, life. That's right, that's right, yeah. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about that, maybe, and how it's inspired this project. And Well, I think the project you see here today is one of the, one of the outputs mm. of my kind of blind assume of photography. Because what happened was, you know, I was born uh, to a doctor, doctor's family. I was forced by my father to study medicine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, as you can see, I still don't like that. So at some point, I think, three years after I worked as an anesthetist in Shanghai, I rebelled and quit my job and went traveling and rock climbing. So. Previous to that, I already discovered photography by looking at some really bad pictures taken by my dad. And then by... <laughs> <laughs> and, and actually, now thinking back, some really good pictures, like uh, proper photojournalist pictures, and, you know, uh, Edward Weston, uh, Ansel Adams, that was it, actually. I remember them all because they were very limited um, supply to me. But uh, I'm sure that's the same reason uh, for you to like, to like photography, because I never saw anything that beautiful, I felt. You know, the world was around me, I lived in it, but it wasn't a, 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 a conscious scene. So I remember seeing Edward Weston's picture, I was like, oh, it really was breathtaking. So I think this was like, perhaps around the time when I was just before my, I was 20. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I always uh, wanted somehow to do photography. Don't know how, but to do photography. In the university in Shanghai, I tried to join the camera club, but I didn't pass the exam mm -hmm. because I, I couldn't answer the questions, the, all the theory questions in the book given by them. I didn't bother reading the book. <laughs> so, anyway, you know, I managed to learn from other people and read books. And by the time I quit from the hospital, I had two biggest love in my life. One was photography, um, one was rock climbing. <laughs> um, anyway, by chance, I married an English climber who I met in China while rock climbing, naturally. <laughs> and then I ended up moving to the UK in 2005. And that was a, a very big change to my life. I, I don't know if you can imagine as a Chinese girl, we were always educated to be obedient, you know, to also to kind of continue the family trade, which is a very promising trade. Um, but I asked myself, you know, what do I want to do in the UK? And I decided to call myself a photographer. It's like that is, I think it's beyond marriage. It's like the wildest thing I have ever dreamt of for myself. It's completely out of question. There's no one in my family who was ever doing anything any close to that. So anyway, I just jumped into it, faked it, <laughs> until, until I feel like I'm about to make it, or still trying to make it. Um, yeah, mm. is that uh, That's a very yes. cool yeah, so, to the question. Yes. Yeah. And so I first came across your work actually in Shanghai. So I, I was living in Shanghai for three years working on, on something <laughs> else. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a little experience of this, this incredibly fast paving pace kind of the country yeah. um, and the environments around me constantly changing and actually getting lost in Shanghai a number of times because like shops had changed. Yes. Um, and I first saw your work when it was being exhibited by the British Council but it was actually the Mother River project. Yes. And I had not didn't meet the forest project for a long it time wasn't after. It completed yet. Yeah, but yeah. you were actually, the you were photographing them two alongside each other, I understand. And yeah. so I'm interested in that dynamic and, <laughs> and how they inspired each other. And maybe you could explain a bit, little bit about the mother It's not like having two boyfriends at the same time, <laughs> actually. <laughs> yeah. so, so what happened was, um, for the first five years in the UK, I worked as a freelance photographer, wedding postcards, whatever I could get my hands on, and did I may. And then I felt I needed to just ask so many questions about photography and about art, I needed to answer them for myself. I decided to do a very big project in order to answer those questions. 
and I thought about doing something about the Yangtze River in China. So I, did, I started a PhD, and that's end of 2010. With that, I went to China, I went to the Yangtze River uh, as the first field trip as end of 2010. Actually, in that trip, I was very confused about the situation of the river, but I already discovered transplanted trees. So, you know, you are just within that landscape, you observe, you take things in. And, but I, I saw these strange, very old trees wrapped up with, um, you know, dripping bags, with needles stabbing into their back. Very painful sight, but they were all standing on brand new um, squares built in the fake old style. <laughs> it's all very confusing. It's just, it's just things don't match up. What's happening here? So I continued to go back to China in order to work out the, the mother, the, the project that became Mother River later. Uh, so I think overall I did, I, I've lost count, maybe eight or nine trips between 2010 to 2014. So I remember a number two trip, I completely felt lost with the river. So I thought, you know what, I'm just going to follow my heart and follow my eyes. I'm going to photograph what I felt. And that picture there, the, it's actually also the, the picture on this book cover was uh, one of the very first pictures I took. Can you imagine for someone to start a project or start getting that large format camera out, it has to be a very profound moment. Something has to be very strong. As Ali said, it's very expensive <laughs> and, and complicated <laughs> to, to get it out. So I, I felt so painful about the trees, and also because I was Chinese, I, you know, I, I could read um, Chinese text, and I worked out why I was seeing so many odd-looking trees in the city, and because there were posters um, everywhere, war posters, as what they do in China, and apparently that was a government policy at the time to this big city called Chongqing, which is, has 30 million people, one of the largest cities in the world. And on the po on the war post, they say we want to have we want to build the city according to five ideals. One is a forest city, number one. And second one is a healthy city, and then a city with good transport, a city that's safe. I think the number five is something like city with good education, something like that. So actually, it's very, very positive. This is a government policy to green the city. Mm. But can you imagine the city is transforming itself every year, you know, for for area to to be built from a flattened blueprint to a mature, at least, community of buildings, not people, yeah? It only takes a few years, but for trees it would take a lot longer to get established, so they can't be bothered waiting. They were just mm -hmm. buying mature trees mm -hmm. from everywhere they can, mm -hmm. and uh, they often didn't care about the origin, whether they were suitable you know, for the environment there. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why you see trees wrapped in plastic bags, mm -hmm. because it was too cold for them in winter. <laughs> in, in Chongqing, the, the plastic bag, you know, there was one there. So I immediately knew this quite a lot to dig into this project. You know, basically all questions, i.e. whose trees were they? What happened to their homeland? And whose money is, it, is, is being spent? And who is making the money? <laughs> and what is going to happen to the trees? So it's all these questions. And I think you can see I was very much politically minded. Yes, the project was initiated because I emotionally, I felt really painful for the trees. Oh, we all love trees. But what kept me going was to dig into these questions and also to discuss these questions with my potential audiences. Mm -hmm. So over the years, every time I went to China for Mother River project, mm -hmm. I also photographed trees. You know, I think actually, 2011, 2012, in terms of photography output, that was mainly for forest, um, because Mother River was purely in research stage. Mm. And then 2013 and 2014, very intense shooting on the river, because I decided to shoot the entire river every 100 kilometers, so that was another many trips. 
so I didn't do much about forest. Mm. Although when I, whenever I saw pictures I would fit, I would go into it. And then when Mother River was finished in shooting, was finished in 2014, I knew that uh, I wanted to finish, well, to, to develop forest and also to somehow complete it. Mm. And then, you know, I looked for opportunities mm. and ways of doing that. Mm. And actually, forest was finished, com shooting was finished in 2017, and both books were published last year. So, yeah, it's a really a parallel process. Mm. And I think the project communicates in a really coherent way, kind of the layers and the, the issues that are going on here mm. in China. And I remember seeing when I was in Xi'an on the um, on the trees, they'd, it was cherry blossom season, okay. and they'd attached plastic cherry blossom onto the trees because oh. they had not Typical. it had not <laughs> flowered that year because the pollution was so bad. And I don't actually know if those were replanted trees, but mm. I was just so confused by that and this situation yeah. and I just thought how can one comment on it and I think that's why your project uh, really speaks to me personally because I think wow this is such a grand <coughs> subject you've taken on it's not just about replanting trees it's about the whole system in China and it's not just about China either it's about how yeah. we're in cities today living or trying to live with nature and shaping it um, and I wonder you know what well, two questions really. How, what do you want people mm -hmm. to take from this? And if you can sum that up. And then also, how has it been responded to in China? Uh, <laughs> let's start with the first question. <laughs> the confidence. Um, well, in a way that, um, you know, I, I see, kind of see myself as a storyteller. You know, so forest, I see it it's quite, as quite a complicated story with many different um, aspects to it. So at first it was all, in a way, judgmental wise, it's quite negative, you know, trees are being tortured. But uh, as the project went on, you know, trees, some did get established and the city did, you know, grow and all those separate elements, the buildings, the people and the brought in trees, they did becoming, they, you know, they were growing together slowly. So I think I, I was, because that's my observation and I wanted to, come to talk about the different aspects with my photographs and very limited but very important text in the book. Mm -hmm. So in that, I think I'm going to read you one story because I think it's kind of, it's a, it's a sample, it's a case study of the whole thing. And um, it's a story about this tree I named it uh, Frank. I don't know why. Um, the pictures of Frank are tucked in at that corner. And uh, I actually found Frank by accident mm -hmm. when I was shooting from the <coughs> river in a very traditional village. At my Y25, mm -hmm. you know, the river, I, I, I marked it, so at the number 25th point mm -hmm. by accident. And Frank is the only tree that I managed to photograph before it was transplanted. It's very interesting. You can never photograph a tree at two different places. With a person, you can. Mm -hmm. See? Yeah. yeah. So once it's moved, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so it was, it was a very interesting um, experience to, to know Frank. So I'll read out the whole thing too, it's not very long. Frank, March 2013. Frank, a 300-year-old Daqing tree, was still standing at its home, the tiny village of Xialiu at the southeast corner of Lijiang Prefecture, an area with a reputation akin to Shangri-La. Ludila, one of the Yangtze River dams, was soon to flood the village. Everything had to move. This is the first time I photographed the tree. June 2013, that's when I tried to find him again because I thought something would happen to the tree because the village was going to be flooded. So I went back, a few months later, went back to see Frank, and nothing was there. June 2013, the entire Xialiu village had been flattened. No trees was left. 
Frank and three other centuries old trees in the village were sold together for about ten thousand pounds. Each family received a small share. Frank was bought by the owners of a planned five-star hotel, Hot Spring Hotel, in a nearby county called Bingchuan, in Dali Bai uh, Prefecture. Construction for the hotel had not yet begun, according to the only security guard on site at the time. Frank, after having its crown and leaves removed, still weighed 70 tons. He broke two cranes before finally getting uprooted from its home of 300 years. It was so big, it could not be transported around the city corners. The city street corners, the local police had to coordinate the move. By the time it reached the hotel, it had cost the new owners about 25,000 pounds. Remember the figure before? Four together for 10. Someone else made an offer for £70,000, but it was proudly declined. When asked if the tree would survive, the guard replied with pride, yes, they were all experts for transplanting trees. It will most definitely survive. So uh, that's June 2013. So basically there was three months gap between the first and second shoot. And um, four years later, so 2017, I managed to go back. November 2017, the Hot Spring Hotel's foundation had finally been laid. But Frank was nowhere to be seen. It had died two years ago. Only the mound of the red soil that it once stood in remained. Apparently, after Frank Another tree was purchased and planted on the same spot, but it also died. Judging by the fates of these old trees, the feng shui of this place was seriously in doubt, as the locals said. So, I think this is one of the most complete stories I collected during this project, and I, I, for me it shows a lot of, you know, the, the complicities I was talking about, that each family had a share. So it's not all bad. Mm -hmm. And anyway, the tree was going to be flooded. Mm -hmm. um, so they did try to rescue also, you know, profiting from it. But then you want to ask why there were so many dams on the river. If you keep digging, you know, uh, it's kind of a never ending journey. So I think really the book, I'm hoping that with the sequence of the pictures will take you on that journey. I'm holding your hands like a tree spotter in, this, in, a, in a dense concrete forest. At first we're all in public areas, and then we go behind doors, and then we go into gated communities, that kind of thing. So, you know, then you come back out, you, you know, I, in the end I think I produced pictures like, um, like this big one there. I, I, I hope you can see that, because I feel by the time I took that picture, I was no longer crying for the trees. I was standing back, trying to take a, a more complete you know, picture, and uh, I just present you with this slice, slice of reality, and you can make up your own mind. You know, some people, actually a lot of people say to me, oh, it's quite nice, because if it's here, it's all been covered by graffiti. So what, I can't even remember the second question, sorry. Oh, come on. Um, the, how did the Chinese take Oh, take I have work? been careful. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to say that being a, I'm not a British citizen, but my family is in China. So I think my work, if it's anything to do with China, it will always be quite subtle. <laughs> yeah. Um, the Mother River was very celebrated in China. It's actually a very political piece of work, but mm. uh, you know, it's very much celebrated in China. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Shall I just tell them a little bit? Yeah. So I yeah. know what works. So Mother River is a project that is very easy to describe. Uh, I photographed the entire 6,211 kilometer Yangtze River in China, every 100 kilometers with a large format film camera. So um, also the river starts from 
five thousand four hundred meters above sea level. What 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 does it mean? It means it's six hundred meters higher than the summit of Mont Blanc. That's mm -hmm. <laughs> that's where the river starts. So it's minus thirty degrees. More deadly, it's got very very thin air. Because as you go high, the air gets thin. So it's like it's expedition photography. Because the Yangtze is seen, is seen as a mother river, mm. like part of China's mm. national identity is printed on our money, like our queen, yeah, mm. so that's our mm. national icon. But uh, the river is always only represented by very celebratory images from very few selected sites, mm. and that's why I thought, okay, I'm just going to do it. I don't care about your hierarchy. I'm doing every one hundred kilometers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're all equally important, and also equally plain vernacular landscapes rather than that kind of very, you know, perfect landscape. So really it's trying to subvert the national icon, but in a very subtle way. <laughs> <laughs> and so you, s you were shooting for about eight, over eight years, which is... With forest. Yeah. Yeah, I always Four wanted years. to have it as a long-term yeah. project. I think, uh, you know, trees grow very slowly. That's the, mm. the least I can give them. <laughs> um, but to shoot for eight years, I mean, that's, that's a long enough time, it's a lot of a motiv motivation to find within yourself and dedication. Um, yeah. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about those things that supported you on the way. I mean, I know financially you got a fantastic award called the Syngenta Award, yeah. which I think that theme that year was about grow and conserve, so yeah. ideal for your project. Yes. Um, and you were also doing your PhD with two pretty... Um, significant yeah. figures who I'm sure were very supportive. So how did you motivate yourself for those eight years and what inspirations came to you, maybe from outside of photography as well? Well, I'm yeah. sure many of you are photographers. You know we are re relentless yeah. people. <laughs> very, very nosy, driven by curiosity, mm. possibly. So, you know, for me, for example, I dreamed about finding out what happened to Frank. If mm. anything, I wanted to be able to go back and to find or not find Frank again. So um, the first stage of the project, I would say is between 2011 to 2014. You know, I produced some, a few strong pictures, not enough to be a series. Um, it won a few very small awards. And uh, because I wanted to go back, I already had plans on how to continue the project, you know, I thought first is to repeat photography, to go back to the same trees and same sites and see, just observe it, you know, and you take what you're given. And But also I wanted to stand back and open up to the wider landscape, and obviously with ultimate goal of finding Frank again. Mm. So I looked for opportunities, and when I saw the Syngenta Award, I was like, my God, this is written for me. The Grow Conserve is perfect for Frank's story. So um, I, I wrote an application, I tried real hard. I remember I even had a copy editor working on my statement. <laughs> so, so I ended up winning it, and so they provided financial support for me to go back and just do whatever I wanted to do. It was like the best commission ever. So I did exactly what I wanted to do. And the, the book also came out as part of that process. So um, I think the motivation really, you know, one is to dig into the story, but also to somehow make this, make, as a storyteller, I, I, I need to kind of reach a point where I can start telling you. I felt like by 2014, at least that stage, is over doesn't mean that it's not going in other directions, mm. but at least that stage is done. And do you? I mean, actually, as yesterday with Alice, um, we were looking at her photos, and she noticed, I think, a coat hanger in one of the images that she'd never seen before. Ah. And I guess I've, I've sometimes had that experience in my own work as as it travels you continue and you start to see it differently and it evolves with you yeah. in, in different guises and in different exhibitions yes. and the way that people respond to it yeah. um, and it keeps teaching you and I think yeah. that's for me what I find addictive about photography is it's yeah. an endless process of exchange and learning and, yes. Yes. and you sometimes surprise yourself by the things that you create and how they feed back to you mm. and how do you see this 
well, when was when did you finish shooting it and how? Uh, what's December period? 2017. Okay, so, so still, still quite fresh. fresh. Role. Yeah. yeah, still fairly fresh. Yeah, yeah. And at how since you sort of finished shooting it, has it has it lived with you? And how has your opinion about the subject changed? I've been trying to not to look at it actually. Mm. So I mean, this show is a very interesting show because this is the first time where the the entire series shown together. You know, I've had various other shows with Forest is always a very small fragment, but it's only, mm. you know, completed. Because mm. when I came back from China, we concentrated on the book first. So that came out last May. And then we were talking about exhibitions. So, um, I don't know, it's hard to judge your, mm. you know, your own work. Have you got a dream place you'd like it to go? Uh, not really. Or who you'd like to see it? No, <laughs> I, I actually, I think what I discovered is, you know, when I did Forest, I, I was just intrigued by the whole thing. I never realized the project was going to be quite popular. And then I realized, you know, of course we all love trees. Mm -hmm. So, like last year I had a tiny show in Hebden Bridge, where I was living at the time. And it was, uh, uh, have, has any of you been to Hebden Bridge? Mm -hmm. yeah. you have you been to Gibson Mill? So it's, it's kind of, you know, you have to walk along the river, it's in uh, Hardcastle Crags, so it's an old mill. And outside of the mill, it's all woodlands. Not virgin woodlands, of course. It pl they were planted around the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. But they are mature trees now. So it was very interesting to see the dialogue <coughs> between the pictures inside of the building and the trees outside of the building. And normally you don't like flag reflection on your mm. pictures, but that time all the tree leaves, they had have, they have the reflection on, on my pictures. It was magic. You know, so all these conservation issues, mm. they were all there, outside and inside. So I found that setting quite magic. But mm. this time, you know, again, it's a very different height. I really like it. Mm. Yeah. Good. <laughs> And just one last question because I think we should open it up. I'm sure people are eager to speak to you. Um, I'm always interested in how photographers know when a project's ended, when you feel like you can't shoot anymore or that it's come to a coherent end. Sometimes it's financial, but how did you how did you know when you felt that it was complete? Well, in a way that, let's say, I only managed to complete two projects since I converted myself to a photographer. Why is Mother River? That one's easy. By the time you reach the mouth of the river, you know, let's call it an end. <laughs> and uh, with Forest, I think, um, in a way, there was a deadline. You know, somebody said, you could have just gone on because the trees are still there, Absolutely. which is true. And in a way, I can still go back to... They're still struggling. With yeah, they are still struggling. But I think, it, with, yeah, with Forest, I feel like one stage of one chapter of the story has reached a quite interesting end. Although, having said that, I feel this chapter, the first section of the book, it was a very new discovery towards the end of that period. It's crying for another face. Mm. <laughs> Calling it back. Yeah. Great. So, have you got any questions in the audience? Please. Uh, just having talked to you last night, I yeah. could see that there's that passion for more trees still there somewhere, and it might be in this country. So I wonder, is that, that be, has that been seeded properly? Is it going to grow into something? It's definitely, that's very interesting because when I came back from China, um, from forest, I was seeing everything with a fresh pair of eyes because, to be honest, my critical awakening happened in the UK when I encounter the post-industrial landscapes for the first time. And uh, so in China, they were all doing this kind of very rapid so-called ecology recovery project. And where I live in Hebden Bridge, the ecology is kind of recovering itself. or oh, it has been doing so in the last uh, 200 years. But at the same time, I can see a lot of, a lot of interventions. And I actually found, I have photographed uh, a small woodland of olive trees on the top of a skyscraper in Manchester. Mm -hmm. Wow. 
let's go and see it happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I don't think I'll necessarily do another forest project over here, but definitely, I, I feel like after living in the UK for 15 years, I'm ready to have another round of exploring here. China, of course, or maybe even somewhere else, but still very much to do with nature. You know, I've been <coughs> wrestling with the woodland in West Yorkshire. We talked about it last night. You know, photographically, it's so difficult because the trees don't grow according to a single perspective. <laughs> <laughs> We want to keep her talking, we haven't got her long. How, Who's next? how successful has it been? I mean, obviously for Frank it was a disaster, but yeah. is it too early to know whether it is going to be a success? Um, I, I think, let's, according to my observation, because I didn't do like a scientific um, survey, the older the trees are, the less likely they will make it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, for example, that tree there, mm -hmm. it's probably not going to make okay. it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's a very rich shopping centre. So it'll just be a way for someone else to make some extra money, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And some trees, like these ones, would probably survive. Mm -hmm. But then again, mm -hmm. their lifespan will be considerably shorter. Mm -hmm. What is the natural lifespan of a tree like this? And if it's 300 really? years already? Something like that, yeah. So it's already ready to die by the time they Yeah, they yeah. yeah. it's about 100 years old, this one. Mm. Ah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And these are all trophy trees, we call them. Mm. What? Trophy? Trophy? Oh, oh yes. yes. As in yeah. yeah, because they don't have history, so they are now showing, you know, they feel they are showing history and taste. I just see money and greed. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a story of the carers for the trees? The ones they're transplanted, obviously there's a need for care. I didn't talk to too many of them. I only talked to one or two so-called experts. Mm. And to be honest, most carers, they do them because they're paid mm. to do it. They don't do it because they, they love the trees. Mm. I came across only one uh, environmental organisation who campaigned for some time about this, mm. this uh, you know, phenomenon in Chongqing, but that didn't really come to anything. Mm. And do you think there's something about the sort of um, uh, culture that doesn't that, that doesn't hold this as something that's worthy, or is it about the interaction? You know, because you say well, everybody loves trees. Yeah. If everybody loves, you know, what what's missing then? That these it's aren't getting the care that they need. I think it's about, my understanding is how people perceive priority. Yes, they do like trees, but money comes first. Chinese cities have a reputation for being amongst the most polluted cities now, and yeah. you said that some of the trees would just die because of the pollution, so that's another battle they have to fight to survive. Yeah, I. My I'm not uh, actually yeah. a tree expert, I mm. just picked up knowledge on my way. I think the trees probably didn't die because of the pollution, but they died because they couldn't adapt mm -hmm. to the new environment. Mm -hmm. They couldn't survive the move, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the city overall has become greener and greener, most of the mm -hmm. because obviously they also plant a lot of young yeah. trees as well as old trees. Mm -hmm. um, so. The, there are positive effects. It's not. Oh, sure. Mm. The yes. Mm. Yes, please. Could you say something about where you've got any um, element of traditional symbolism incorporated in these images? You know, like the, the, okay. the red green color scheme or feng shui geometry or whatever, because juxtaposing that with all this modernist artificiality and. and um, uh, displacement and so on yeah. seems like an interesting theme. Yeah, interesting. It, it was unlikely output for me as well. So originally, I had a color palette, palette for myself. At some point, at some point, when I had enough pictures to think about this, because I was mainly shooting in cities, so uh, I was obsessed with three colors: gray, the concrete, green trees, and a little bit red. Um, when I discovered this, I think there were a few things going on. Um, when I was, I was just walking and walking for days and ends in the city, observing, doing the tree spotting thing. 
and I started thinking more abstractly on colors. I felt like they were not just abusing trees, they were abusing this whole, whole concept of trying to be green. So here, gr green really is not a symbol of life anymore. It's uh, a, a long way away from that. So I started dreaming about taking pictures somehow that ha had more green in, somehow, just to make a, you know, say about this. And I started doing research. And uh, you know, it's one of those things, as soon as you start thinking about something, you talk to people or you gather information. And someone told me, oh, do you know, at a place they, they poured green paint onto a quarry face to make it green? <laughs> I was like, oh. I was like dreaming that picture. But then I discovered that news was from 10 years ago. It's impossible to trace. Even if I found it, it probably had faded. And I did a lot of other research. I even tried in Chongqing with pictures with large, like these large uh, areas of green, but they didn't work. So when I went to try to find Frank again, uh, it's a landscape and the light and everything is utterly different from my previous pictures. It's blue sky. It's like southern Spain. Think about that as a reference. Red soil, blue sky. No, we don't do that. And strong sunshine. No, we don't do that. <laughs> so, um, as soon as I got there, I met someone who was a tree expert. And, you know, we, I asked him about this thing. Oh, well, I'm working on trees, ecology, and, you know, conservation. Have you heard of anything here? Blah, blah, blah. And obviously, they were transplanting trees, too. And um, it's kind of almost like by fate, but also by chance. After I photographed the empty site of where Frank used to be, we got lost in a mountain, all dramatic, yeah, but it's true. And um, we drove through this valley. I could see shining, shining green patches on the top of a mountain, broken mountain, like a quarry, but very, very high, very big, very green. It's like, what's this? Mm -hmm. And then the moment came again, we drove through it. At some point, you must stop the car. <laughs> and um, I was faced with things like this. It was like, shoot or not shoot? It's not a question. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, when, with the editing, I was aware of the Chinese influence. I think the Chinese aesthetic, it, the influence of that in my work is a very, very subtle one. Often, I try to reject that because I feel it's a lot of stereotyped you know, depiction of it. But a lot of Chinese readers pick up on that, you know, the light and the color. So yes, red and green, according to Chinese uh, Taoism philosophy, is a, a, a pair of colors in balance to each other. Red is hot, green is cold. And, um, but, uh, so I kind of, I picked on this color combination and the irony that here it didn't look like imbalance. So I just went for it, and uh, I also tried to shoot when the sun was not shining and the colors were not there at all. And I was like, you know, let's just go, let's just go for it. So I, instead of waiting for the impossible cloudy day, I waited for noon, flat, strong light at noon and just took most of the pictures that in there and uh, persuaded myself that they should be in the book. <laughs> Please. I think you make, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I think you make a good point about priorities. I think everyone, even they're not particularly tree conscious, feel a loss when they're gone. Yeah. But it comes down to a matter of priorities when the commercial value rises to a certain exactly. point. Yeah. They'll They'll miss it, but yeah. it will go. But uh, it's OK. Yeah. yeah, it's less yeah. simple. You know, it's like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Like you have many banyan trees in yes. ancient, not yes. just old, but ancient yes. trees. Yeah. Um, which is the same story as Frank. I've seen them being translated brutal. And everyone will feel the loss when yeah. they're gone, but mm. they're usually in conspicuous places where they have some commercial value. Yeah, trophy trees. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
please. Um, you mentioned that one there as yeah. being in a very rich sort of shopping area and there's a trophy tree. Yeah. Did, did you notice in different kinds of area there was sort of different trends for the kinds of tree or appearance sort of like kind of, it seems almost aspirational, sort of aspirational affectations of an area and I was just wondering if you noticed sort of, sort of these areas whether they had a certain kind of tree that they were looking for or if it was just any tree. It's mainly about money, mm. unfortunately. So the rich the richer the area is, for example, shopping centres and very expensive new apartment developments. That kind of areas typically will have expensive trees. Mm -hmm. Expensive means either the tree is very old, or the tree is rare, or the tree is somehow the tree is held with some. You know, certain trees are more respected. Mm -hmm. For example, in China, ginkgo. Is a tree that we saw we see as a live fossil. It's a tree normally planted at uh, temples. So in Chongqing, the rumor says they've got at least half of all the ginkgo trees in Chongqing. It's not a local tree, but they some you know for those reasons they like it. Mm -hmm. And that area, for example, I don't think any of those trees. Uh, are expensive because really it's just a community center really it's got no commercial value so why would they put uh, any expensive trees there it's very the logic is simple so if it costs a lot it doesn't matter what kind it is it's just valuable it, yeah it's about uh, to show off that I've got a bigger lawn <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah it's like that We just um, slip in one more question about Frank, and you went back to the community to see what it was, the aftermath yes. of losing Frank. Yeah, we could just speak about that of that, um, yeah. what they lost when they lost. That, it, it's what, it's quite then? interesting because often I find that people like us who are very sensitive, often and you know, kind of romantic and sentimental, but actually most village people are they're very just practical. Yeah, so I, you know, I, if I ask them, for example, why are trees important to you, most of the time the answers we got was, oh, because it's really hot here, we really need the shade. Mm -hmm. And it, it's true. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes perhaps they do feel a deeper connection, but they're not able to express it, you know, in that way, in a very obvious way. And with Frank, I think, you know, obviously every day they felt like it's a loss. But um, there's nothing they can do, they just move on. And they shared the money? Yes, they shared the money. Yeah. It's not the leader who told me, it's just you know, the, the villagers who were just still knocking about. Mm. What, what happened to the people in the village if it was flooded? Did they have to move? Oh yeah. So nothing left? Nothing, nothing. nothing left. So the typically trees. they would be given a certain amount of money to or well, to contribute towards a new house. Um, normally that's like not enough at all. Or they would be moved to somewhere else very far away. You know, for example, when they build the Three Gorges Dam, some people were moved, let me think how many kilometers, 2,000 kilometers away mm. to the mouth of Shanghai, this island, the last island on the Yangtze River. So they were moved, it's completely different. Everything is different, it's flat and they have no history, so they will move to there. But then again, they were stuck in a mountain uh, with a very hard agricultural life. This is the argument, yeah. And now they are in Shanghai. They are Shanghai citizens. Their children will at least have a lot more opportunities. And they also are given a lot more money. They always will be looked after because of the sacrifice they made. So it really, I think it's, it's very complicated. Yeah. Thank you.